Well, the message for today, because this is a Pentecost weekend, the message for today that I thought I would share with you will have to do with the message that I've already recorded for you for tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow there will be no services. You have recorded my message for this day, uh, for the not this day, but for this for the Pentecost this year. And uh, in that message, of course, I uh, the identity of Israel again and the question of, e- of the house of Israel came up as well because uh, the Pentecost commandment was given to the house of Israel initially, as you know. And there was the wave sheaf offering uh, that was offered every year in the house of Israel. So in my message for tomorrow, you'll be listening that I've explained that wave sheaf and its meaning. And then I expanded, of course, my whole uh, message then to the book of Acts and uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, brethren, could not have been given because of the backsliding Israel. And uh, Jesus Christ first had to die and come back to life before the Holy Spirit was to be allowed to humankind. And, uh, of course, part of all of that is the house of Israel. And I thought it was appropriate for this Sabbath, just several hours prior to the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits. I thought it was very appropriate to, again, address the issue of the house of Israel, but uh, to address it from the point of view of the Apostle to the Gentiles. There is the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, and the house of Israel. And to understand Paul's view of Israel, it is first important to understand something about the man himself. And I think also the next Sabbath I will dedicate the Sabbath message to this very topic, because I would like to kind of round it up and uh, connect it with this first part. So again, you know, to understand the overall view that Paul had of the house of Israel, it's important to understand something about him. He was a product of the master of his intellect. He was the product of his moral discipline, and he was the product of his view of the virtue, nobility, and role of his ancestry. Well, the Apostle Paul, brethren, accepted as fact that he was destined to be used as a life-giving force. Now, this was, in fact, his divine calling of which he strove to be worthy. And perhaps more than any other servants of God that we know, he would be the one who strove so much, you know, to be worthy of that calling and to de- demonstrate that in his own life. Please go to Philippians chapter 3. When it comes to social or societal status, uh well, when it comes to that, uh, Paul had every reason to boast. He could be probably or the, 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 the most boastful person of his societal st- status because he says of himself in Philippians chapter 3 verse 5, he explains himself, he says, circumcised, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He was a Jew. He mentions that in Acts chapter 21 and 22. Acts chapter 21, verse 39. I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. So Tarsus was a well-known city throughout the Roman Empire of that day. And in the next chapter, Acts 22, verse 3, Paul says, I am a Jew in his statement before Agrippa, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Kilikia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all are today. So, you see, the the autobiography provided in Paul's letters and in Paul's statements, but the autobiography specifically mentioned here in Letter to the Philippians, tells us much more. He is the offspring of Abraham, a son of of the covenant memorialized in Genesis chapter 15. His circumcision on the eighth day was symbolic of his connection to these promises given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. So let's review those uh, promises God gave to Abraham in chapter 17, verse 1, starting in verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, in Hebrew, El Shaddai, walk with before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and you may multiply and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, 
Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make you into uh, nations, and kings shall come before you. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I'll give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I'll be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your offspring after you throughout your their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You see, this is what the Apostle Paul was alluding, brethren, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. So he was making this direct connection between himself and his ancestor Abraham. And this covenant that God established with Abraham. Verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So, Saul's circumcision on the eighth day, more than his lineage, brethren, defined him as the offspring of Abraham and set him apart as one with whom the Eternal had a covenant relationship. When reiterated in Genesis 22, verse 15, after Abraham demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, the son of El Shaddai's promise, God adds another promise to Abraham and his descendants. Verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I'll surely bless you and I'll... Surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your offspring, verse 18, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And that's exactly what happened, brethren, because in the offspring of Abraham, in Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth are indeed blessed. Blessed. Now, this is a promise that the Messiah would be an offspring of Abraham, as we read in Galatians 3.16. But to appreciate the importance of these events to him, we have but to read Romans chapter 9, verse 3 and further. Romans chapter 9, verse 3. Paul says, My kinsmen according to the flesh are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But not all are children of Abraham simply because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring which we can also read in Galatians 3.29, that we are all Abraham's children through faith. Now, offspring from the Greek language is sperma, and the authorized, ver the King James Version translates sperma as seed 43 times, and issue once. It is an agricultural reference to the seed from which a plant germinates. More specifically, brethren, it's the seed, the grain or kernel, which contains within itself the germ of the future plants. And such grain or kernels are kept for the sowing, for a harvest, because they possess the vital force of our life-giving power. As a child, Saul of Tarsus was nurtured on 
the belief that he was a life-giving force connected by birth and circumcision to the Messiah. As a young man, he shaped his identity and destiny on that belief. Now, the Apostle's autobiography could end with circumcision and his connection to the wandering Aramean Abraham, but it does not. Saul of Tarsus was a son of Benoni, Rachel's sorrow, Israel's beloved wife who died giving birth to Benjamin, the son of Jacob's right hand, a substitute for Joseph, the favored son uh, that uh, Jacob thought he had lost. Now the favored son, he would not only see, would not only see again in his last days. Now how special was Benjamin? Well, Saul of Tarsus would have understood himself to be among those about whom Moses said in Deuteronomy 33, verse 12, and this is how Moses describes Benjamin, Deuteronomy 33, 12, the beloved of the Lord dwells in safety. The high God surrounds him all day long and dwells between his shoulders. Now, so obviously, you know, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus actually, he certainly uh, understood himself to be among uh, those who are beloved of the Lord and have this blessing as described in Deuteronomy 33. Now Saul is, as you know, the Hebrew name of the Apostle Paul. Unlike the first king of Israel, who is also called Saul, who bore that, that name and was also from the tribe of Benjamin, this Saul was a zealot. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. More perhaps like his ancestor Mordecai, to whom the salvation of the Jews Jewish nation is attributed, and because of whom many became Jews. In Esther, the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, you read that because that the decree was revoked and the Jews got right to defend themselves on that certain day, many people feared the Lord and many people even became Jews out of fear <laughs> for their lives. And uh, Mordechai, who saved actually the Jewish nation, and his uh, the relative Esther are described in the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Now, all this, you know, all this background that I've just pointed out, all this helps explain Saul's unrelenting persecution of the church, a group of people whose beliefs threatened his own. And considering that, please go to Galatians chapter 1. Now, of course, it's not speaking Galatians. It's not speaking about the law of God. The law of God is not done away with. The uh, ritual laws and the ritual rites were done away with, including circumcision. So, but there were, you know, men with scissors who came down to, to, to Galatia trying to convince the relatively new converts of their need to be circumcised in order to be saved. Now, of course, that's not the requirement, and uh, we don't see that as requirement even in the New Testament church later after the, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in Galatians chapter 1, here is what Paul describes his history, verse 13 and 14, and then after this we'll go to Acts chapter 9 to see when he was called by Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 13 and 14, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And in Acts chapter 9, in verse 1, Now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. Now, you see, he was during this period in his life a type of what we read of Benjamin in Genesis 49, 27, when his father Jacob describes Benjamin as a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey and at evening devile, uh, dividing the spoil. You see, there was this passion in the Apostle Paul, the passion that consumed was instilled in him from childhood. Luke records in Acts 26.4 Paul's speech before Agrippa in which he describes his education in Judaism and his manner of life learned among 
his own nation in Jerusalem. Now Paul, like his own father, was trained to be a Pharisee, the strictest party of the Jewish religion. He advanced beyond many his own age in his training, as we can read in Galatians 1.14. And this is undoubtedly uh, because, as he says of himself in Philippians 3, he was blameless before the law, before the Torah. For an outline of Saul's training, and particular the history that framed it, it uh, we have to read Psalm 78. Now to appreciate the quality of it is to know that he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, a member of the council who advocated for the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John in the church in Acts chapter 5, verse 34 to 39. He intervened on their behalf, warning that the council's opposition to the church may in fact put them in opposition to God's will. Now, learned rabbinic schools were a most prominent feature of the apostolic age, the most eminent were the rival schools of Hillel and Shammai. Both schools were Pharisaic, but Hillel's, which exalted traditions as superior even to the law, far was far and away the more influential of the of the two. The greatest teacher in the top school was Gamaliel, whose fame is celebrated in the Talmud. His learning and his character were beyond. Uh, well, were greatly revered. That is, were beyond reproach. He is one of the he is one of the seven Jewish doctors of the law, who have been honored with the title of Rabban. What do you suppose, young Saul, learned about himself in a school where the traditions of his ancestors were more revered than the law before which he was blameless? Well, this brief autobiography of Saul might be enough for us to understand the pride that animated a self-will and was at times impetuous that fueled his very, his fiery disposition. Now, it all led him to conclude upon reflection with the influence of the Holy Spirit it led him to to deduce that he was a man in need of self-control. His zeal, uh, he his zeal, Paul later admitted, was misguided and made him no more than a blasphemer, persecutor, and a man of violence. In another letter, this time to first letter to Timothy, chapter two, chapter two, chapter one, that is. In this letter, we could find some uh, more explanation of his biography. First Timothy 1, and verse 12 and 13. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. There is, however, we might say there is more to this man's pedigree. Saul of Tarsus, or Paul later, was a Roman citizen, brethren. He did not come from a municipal, a uh, little municipal area or a colony, colony, a conquered city used as a Roman outpost, but he was hailing from a free city, Urbs Libera a city governed by its own magistrates exempt from Roman occupation. Absent were the garrisons that overshadowed other territories and the imposition of Roman values on his Hebrew upbringing. Given the fact that Paul was freeborn, as he explains in Acts chapter 22 and verse 28 in one of his confessions before the kings, so given the fact that he was freeborn, we can deduce that his own father was given a grant of citizenship, well, probably as a reward for his service in one of Rome's many civil wars. Now, this status did not imply affluence, further attested to by Paul's learn, uh, Paul, the fact that Paul learned manual trade. He was a tent maker, as mentioned in Acts chapter 18, verse 3. 
Now, nonetheless, his status as a freeborn Roman citizen afforded him the protection of Roman law and all the benefits of a citizen of the most powerful civilization on earth. In the first century, brethren, there would have been only a few people who felt more connected to or looked with greater longing for the Messiah than Saul of Tarsus. Furthermore, Paul's own words about himself should be sufficient to debunk the many misrepresentations in scholarship that Paul's beliefs stand in direct opposition to Judaism. Brethren, they do not. Neither do they support Judaism to the degree it stands in opposition to Scripture. Now, although there are many truths in Judaism, it is essentially just another false religion because we always keep in mind the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 59, Matthew 59, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Now please turn to Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul was called by Jesus Christ, who intervened and uh, and called him. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, and as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with uh, him stood speechless, the men stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Now Saul, verse 8, got up from the ground and uh, though his eyes were open, he could not he could not see, he could see nothing. And leading by him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Verse 9, and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But then I said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at, in Jerus at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before... Now, brethren, pay close attention. Bear my name before the... Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And that's exactly what happened in, 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 in Paul's ministry. He first made the name of God known before the Gentiles. Then he went to the kings. And finally, he uh, went with his message you know, to the sons of Israel. So it's not just to the nations or Gentiles, but also to the sons of Israel. Now Paul makes, he always makes a distinction between Jew and non-Jew, or ta etne, or Gentiles. Those among the nations that rep responded to God's calling and elected uh, are to become Christ's are never referred to by Paul as Christians. He refers to the elects as belonging to Christ or believers. Now, Israel means the children of Abraham, of which the Jews are. Paul never uses a phrase like New Israel or Spiritual Israel. You can hear both of those terms in this nominal churchianity. So, uh, he never uses the phrase New Israel or Spiritual Israel. Perhaps most significant of all, he never refers to the Israel or Spiritual Israel as the church. Galatians 2, verse 1 and 2, we have uh, we have not read it yet, we are going to read it now. Then after an interval of 14 years, 
I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and uh, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now in Galatians chapter 3 verse 6, Even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Now, Romans chapter 3. We have two verses to read there. Romans 3, verse 28. Well, <laughs> three verses, actually. Romans 28, verse uh, chapter 3, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Now promises were made to Abraham, brethren, concerning the nations which were fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Father and Jesus Christ were inhabited. Uh, well, they were not inhabited. I mean, I want to say they were faithful to their promises. They, well, the, 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 the promised land was inhabited. That's what I had in mind. Anyway, the, the Father and the Jesus Christ, they were faithful to, their, to those promises, you know. And it is through that faithfulness that the blessing of Abraham has been extended to all nations. Now, the inclusion of the other nations into the uh, elect people of God, it is through corp incorporate, incorporation into Jesus Christ. Now, there is one section in Scripture that we have been paying attention a lot lately. We've been paying attention to Romans 9, 10, and 11 uh, as something very important anyway. And so, uh, in Romans 1, uh, 9 through 11, if there is one truth that underpins these three chapters of, in Romans, it is that Jewish Christianity, so-called Jewish Christianity, is not the topic. Now, in these chapters, Paul speaks of Israel as a whole, and that regardless of ethnic background or national identity, even regardless of gender, we should come to understand ourselves in relation to the house of Israel. And let us hope briefly at the... Uh, 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 let us now hope and let us look briefly, at the more poignant sections uh, of Romans 9, 10, and 11. It is important, brethren, because there is a mystery, strange mystery, explained right there in Romans 9 through 11. In Romans 9, the Apostle Paul says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I may not, I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accuser, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the, according to the flesh. Who, who are those who are according to the flesh, his kinsmen, they are Israelites to whom belong the adopting as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple, the temple service, he says. Uh, and the temple service and uh, the temple service belong to them and of the promises whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. But it is still, verse 6, not as though the whole of God has failed. For there are not all Israel who are uh, descendants from Israel. Nor are they all children because they are Arabs' descendants. But through your Isaac... Through Isaac, your descendant, will the, the, the whole nation will, will be named. And, uh, you know, that's basically about the description of the Israel of the flesh. 
Now in verse 8 it says, this is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regard, regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I'll come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there were, there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins in one, by one, by one man, our father Isaac. For through the twins, well, through all the, uh, for though the twins were basically not yet born and had not been born, anything, you know, good or bad, anything good or bad, uh, where am I? I'm supposed to be in uh, verse 8. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I'll come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. And for uh, though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we then say? There is no justice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Now for the scripture verse 17, say to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Where uh, a fault for who resists his will. On the contrary, verse 20, Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable to use and another for common use. What if, verse 22, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with mercy, uh, with endured with patience, vessels of wrath prepared for his destruction. Verse 23, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles, or nations, or ethnos. As he says also in Hosea, I'll call those who were my, not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved, and it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sea, sons of Israel be like the, uh, like the sand of the sea, it is remnant that will be saved. You know, for the Lord will execute his wrath on the earth throughout and quickly, thoroughly and quickly, and just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord or Sabbath had left to us a posterity, we would have been born we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain, attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Well, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it has, it is written, Behold, I lay Zion's stone of stumbling and rock of offense, and he who believes in him 
will not be disappointed. Then we continue verse 1 of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to, not according, in, in accordance with the knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeing to establish their own, they did not study, the, uh, they did not subject themselves, that is, to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for forgiveness to evermore who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, you know, to bring into heaven, that is to bring uh, Christ down. Or, who will succeed or who will uh, who will descend into the abyss? <laughs> who will de- uh, descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Uh, that is the word of faith which we were preaching. That if you confess. That your mouth, with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the, uh, the mouth of his confessors, result, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, what does, the, what does the scripture say? Verse 11. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Well, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the of the Lord will be saved. Now, how then will they call on Him who whom they are not believed? How? Will they believe in him whom they, they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord who has believed our report, so faith comes from hearing and the hearing by the word of God. But I say, surely they have, they have never heard, have they? Well, indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know they did they? First Moses says, I'll make you jealous by that which is a nation, a nation, by a nation without uh, understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I m- became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate uh, people. And now, in chapter 11, we see that Israel is not casting away. Because, you know, that would be something outstanding. So God is faithful, God remains faithful regardless of what Israelites did to him in the past. Regardless of the fact that they have no longer a mighty, uh, well, well, we can't say mighty, mighty uh, army, but uh, Israel is not cast away. It will not be completely annihilated. It will not be completely lost because it is God's people. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So in chapter 11, verse 1, I say then, has God not rejected his people? Has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
God has not rejected his people, you know, contrary to the belief of this churchianity. Oh, there is new Israel. Oh, God has uh, annihilated the old people and now he has chosen us. No, verse 3, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. Ma, but what is the divine response to him, to Elijah? Well, I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see and not, uh, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, now he's a quote in Psalm, let their table, cl- table become snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. I say then, did they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgressions, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgressions is riches, for the world and their failures is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their, will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Christ, who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostolic apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of Tao, though, is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But it's if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and had become a, uh, had become partaker with with them, of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root, uh, but the root supports you now because you've been now grafted into the into the uh, uh, olive, into the house of Israel. That's why we are now spirit-led Israelites. You will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be disconceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell severity, but to you, God's kingdom, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, if cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grant, grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches uh, be grafted into their own olive tree? Verse 25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. That a partial hardening uh, has happened to Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Also, all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and here he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them, 
when I take away their sins. So from the standpoint of the gospel, they are, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the altars. You know, uh, the, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so they are also now, these also now have been disobedient, they, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be were shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to few. Uh, and to all, of course, in the end. At first there come few, and then after the after the while, then he will draft he will draft in all the rest, and all all those will be will be grafted in, they become Israelites and they'll attain salvation. So if God, verse 21, did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either if you are boastful and conceited. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you God's kindness if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. You see, that's the mystery that Paul explains. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your generation, in your own estimation as well, that is a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And also all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now from the standpoint, verse 28 from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of, of, of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable indeed. Verse 30. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and uh, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who has first, give, forgiven, first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Well, for those from, uh, for, from him, and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, uh, brethren, you see, we have now analyzed the character of Paul and we realize indeed that with such an outstanding man as well as he is, God could work out his plan uh, here on the earth below. And so, the result will be marvelous. You know, when the full number of the Gentiles get in, well, here it comes the salvation to the rest of Israel as well because the rest of Israel from the one, those who left the uh, Egypt to the others who are coming for the second resurrection all Israel will be saved 
and all Israelites they are just uh, broken off they will be able to be again to join again the their plant to be replanted and of course to experience salvation we can spend some more time on this topic also the next sabbath